Hey, what up? I be that sequential geek. Welcome to my channel, a sequential geek. Yeah, I'm following up from the videos that I made on New Year's. Uh, I was like that playoff words from Dungeons and Dragons, the um, garage and diecast dragons finds. So one of the treasures that I found in that video is this uh, carrying case. And when I was looking up information to provide just some facts while I was displaying the contents here. On action figures, I found out information about Bernie Loomis. In particular, I started off with that History Channel documentary, Toys That Made America, Season 2, Episode 1, which I suggest you check out. Except, in contrast to the other research that I've done, Bernie Loomis was not lucky. They depicted him as being lucky in that History Channel documentary when he was an executive at Kenner. He was running Kenner. It wasn't luck that he got the Star Wars contract. If you want to learn about marketing, advertising, merchandising, I suggest you look up information about Bernie Loomis, his legacy. He's left behind um, five points that I've focused on in particular and keep an ear out for them during this video. 1978 to 1985, Kenner, thanks to the leadership of Bernie Loomis and the success of George Lucas's mythology, Star Wars, Kenner sold 300 million Star Wars action figures from 1978 to 1985. Bernie Loomis has affected your life. So the more I learn about Bernie Loomis, the more that I'm realizing uh, this guy is not somebody just to overlook real quick. The Toy Manufacturers of America, now the Toy Association out in New York State, have added him to their Hall of Fame. I'd like to also thank the channel Carbon Scoring. Give props to them, that YouTube channel, and the website steveotter.com, markwestwriter.blogspot.com, toyassociation.org, vintageactionfigures.com, and History Channel, Toys That Made America. Please check out those resources. Furthermore, Bernie Loomis and George Lucas, for that matter, they both saw how, for example, by 1966, more than 100 million Matchbox toys were sold each year. Without a backstory, Matchbox cars were created by John William Odell. Jack Odell is there on the left in that picture. He's the creator of Matchbox cars. The other guy is the co-founder of the company Lesney Products. Oh, that's right, Leslie Charles Smith. He partnered with Rodney Smith. They met during World War II. I don't think they're related, but they combined their names for Lesney Products, the die-cast metal company that manufactured the cars that were designed, created by Jack O'Dell. So Jack O'Dell's daughter could not bring toys larger than a matchbox to school. So in 1953, he created that first matchbox car. It was a steamroller in the United Kingdom. And then years later, turns out Lesney Products, the die-cast metal toy company, was declared insolvent in the United Kingdom in 1982. I think like a year later, another company, if you keep an ear out for that, declared bankruptcy in 1983. Anyway, that Matchbox manufacturing company, Lesney Products, ended up getting bought by Mattel in the late 90s. Bernie Loomis, by the way, he was born in 1923 in the Bronx, poor neighborhood. He passed in 2006. He also coined a new phrase called toyetic. I'd like to start with that because toyetic is a term that uh, Bernie Loomis coined. It's when somebody gives you a proposal, somebody gives you an idea for a toy, something to manufacture, and then you can just see the myriad of uh, licensing deals, uh, just the pyramid of money that you can make, manufacturing, licensing, advertising a particular product. You can see all the spin-off items, just the empire that can be built based off of that idea. That's moment when you have that realization. It's called toyetic. That's a phrase that Bernie Loomis created as part of this toy industry. So he started working at Mattel in 1960, Bernie Loomis. 1967 saw a lot of stuff going down. In particular, Mattel created toy brand Hot Wheels. They bought a plastic uh, model kit company that had like a larger scale, right? Like 125th, I think it was. And then they used the designs for that to make their Hot Wheels toys in the 164th, 165th smaller scale to compete with Matchbox. Well, Bernie Loomis, running the show over there, 
He was the first to create a TV series based on a toy property, Mattel's Hot Wheels. It premiered in September 6, 1969 on ABC in the United States. The Federal Communications Commission declared the series wasn't entertainment. They deemed it a 30-minute commercial for Hot Wheels. ABC ended up canceling the series in 1971, even though they protested. They got a couple of seasons in. Well, at that point, Bernie Loomis was gone. He became the president of Kenner in 1970. And that Hot Wheels TV series is the reason why Loomis, about 20 years later, was dubbed the man who invented Saturday morning. That's right. Also in 1967, General Mills bought Kenner Toy Company. Three years later, Bernie Loomis ends up leaving Mattel to become the president of Kenner. Also in 1967, The Electronic Labyrinth, that movie, the first short by George Lucas was created. THX-11384 EB he created that short film while he attended the University of Southern California. It existed originally in 16 millimeter and then eventually VHS. This short was used as the basis for Lucas's first feature film in 1971, titled THX-1138, which starred Robert Duvall and Maggie McComey. Notice a lot of, uh, you want to call them, like, precursor, THX-1138. You can see um, it influenced the design, the look of, of a lot of the Star Wars movies because THX-1138, it was this movie about the future that was a dystopia where people were constantly being monitored and controlled through video and taking pills and such. While that was going on with George Lucas, he followed up with 1973's American Graffiti that got an Academy Award. Lucas also noticed, I'm sure, while he was working at a comic book shop, I know at one point he worked for a comic book shop, he knew that if you put something like Doctor Doom, something that had a mythology, a backstory to it, it would sell more than just some other character that didn't have a backstory to it. He was able to see the success of shows growing up, like you know, Buck Rogers and uh, Flash Gordon. All those brands were being used to sell product. As well, George Lucas was also learning a lot about the many, 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 many influences of Akira Kurosawa. In particular, if you check out the movie Hidden Fortress, there's a lot of likeness from Hidden Fortress mimicked in his Star Wars movies. George Lucas invested a half a million of his own money into pre-production and accepted less pay to maintain creative control and the rights to merchandising. For Empire Strikes Back, George Lucas made sure not to give manufacturing rights in perpetuity, um, which is what happened with Bernie Loomis in Star Wars. Kenner got the manufacturing rights for Star Wars in perpetuity. So in 1977, you had the New York City Toy Fair. This guy, Ray Wagner, who was running Mattel in the 70s, said, movies don't sell toys. It was Ray Wagner, eventually later on in the early 80s, ended up becoming successful with his He-Man product, which was not based off of a movie. It was based off of a television show. But movies do not sell toys. Ray Wagner and everybody else was saying that. What else was going on in the... In the 70s, that was leading up to the success of the Star Wars action figures. Well, you got the Atari VCS game system, right? There were no action figures that were popular. Uh, by the way, let's mention this other company here. The Hassenfeld Brothers. You see, they had, as of 1964, they had their G.I. Joe. That's right, G.I. Joe. In 1964, G.I. Joe, 11 and a half inch tall plastic figure. It was the Hassenfeld brother, the one that was really the mind behind their success, Merle L. Hassenfeld. He was the one that coined the term action figure. And they were former school supply makers, uh, pencil makers, the Hassenfeld brothers. And the world would eventually know their company as Hasbro. So because of the Vietnam War, people were not spending money on... Uh, developing, promoting war toys. Not soldiers, not action figures, just no war dolls, none of that stuff. So by the 70s, people like George Lucas and Bernie Loomis saw that as a vacuum to be filled. And unlike in the History Channel movie documentary, Bernie Loomis was approaching 20th Century Fox. He was knocking on their door. Had that toyetic moment with Star Wars, and Bernie Loomis was just like... We got to get some money to be made here. Bosk. I 
think this was my mail away Bosque. I'm not sure. So, 1970, Bernie Loomis became president of Kenner at this point. After he left Mattel, he takes existing shows and creates toys around it. Because of that law that got created, thanks to his Hot Wheels animated cartoon, Bernie Loomis now has to take existing shows and create toys around it. Like Steve Austin's $6 million Hala Man. Lee Majors is in the middle there in that black and white picture. Mr. Loomis on the left. Lee Majors, by the way, was Ash's dad in the TV show Ash vs. the Evil Dead series. So we're talking something that exists already with a built-in fan base. That's the 1970s. They had one of the biggest selling toys in the world with their $6 million man doll. But also, more specifically, what else was going on in the 70s I want to point out. $6 million man versus Bigfoot. That's right. You had Secret of Bigfoot. Part 2. That episode of The Six Million Dollar Man aired on ABC February 4th, 1976. It's the 18th episode of Season 3 of The Six Million Dollar Man. You also had the Bigfoot board game. You also had Leonard Nimoy hosting the show In Search Of. There he is with his Christmas sweater on. That includes Bigfoot on it. That's right. In Search Of, the TV show hosted by Leonard Nimoy. Season 1, Episode 5. Was the episode that came out in April 1977 about Bigfoot. So no wonder we got Chewbacca in the 1977 Star Wars movie. And what else is going on now? We're talking Hasbro turned down Star Wars, right? Mego, Mattel, they all turned down Star Wars. Mego Corporation, one of the most powerful toy companies in the 1970s with their 8-inch action figure. They passed up. Yeah, Mego passed up on Star Wars. Mego ended up going bankrupt in 1983. Right, a year after Matchbox, uh, the Lindsay uh, Diecast Metal Company, was declared insolvent in 1982. So Bernie Loomis, president of Kenner in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was Loomis that had been approaching 20th Century Fox in 1977. There's Bernie Loomis on the right, George Lucas on the left. Right when they made their merchandising deal where Kenner got the rights to manufacture Star Wars toys in perpetuity. Bernie Loomis, in a quote, basically said how he liked Star Wars. He liked the robots. That's what he said. Think about it, robots. Robots sell. Right? It's the 1960s, 1970s. Right? That, that's considered cutting edge. Having stories with robots in them. Yeah, that was a deal that was made over George Lucas's objections. Bernie Loomis coined the phrase toyetic, as I said before, when he perceived the merchandising and licensing potential in an object. He is all in that exclusive deal with Lucas and the 20th Century Fox after that toyetic moment he had. So he got the Star Wars deal and it cost Kenner $100,000 a year for that exclusive deal. Back then you had the Atari game system that was popular. Uh, that was gaining popularity, but I mean, that's the closest thing people had to a computer. There was no video streaming. There was nothing on demand. That's why they shied away from uh, making products around movies. Movies were here today, gone tomorrow as far as the public's collective consciousness goes as far as spending money. So Mego Toy Compor Corporation Hasbro. So all those toy companies just decided to pass on Star Wars because it was just one movie as far as they were concerned. You know, today you had the phenomena of all these movies being interconnected with the MCU. Well, back by 1977 through the early 80s, the new phenomena were these trilogy movies that were carrying the lore from the previous movie onto the next, building upon a mythology. So no one expected Star Wars to be any different, though, before 1977. When Bernie Loomis got the deal, they would do things initially like, you know, take their Steve Austin uh, action figure, their doll, and hang that from um, some string in front of a, a projector screen and then project the image of the X-Wing fighter, for example, onto that doll so they can get an idea of the size of what the uh, X-Wing fighter would be if they had used the same model for their Steve Austin doll and transfer that over to Star Wars. And they realized it was just way too big. X-Wing fighter would take up, you know, a quarter of a kid's room, you know, half a kid's room. It's too expensive. It's too big. And they knew that they had to shrink the toys in order for the vehicles itself to also be of a compatible size 
for shipping and for storing for kids to use. So they said, well, how big should the toys be? And Bernie Loomis goes, this big. Just randomly went like that. They measured it and it turned out to be three and three quarters inches tall. And that became the size of the average Star Wars figure. And when they made the action figures, check this out. It's a term. They didn't coin, they didn't invent the term. They didn't coin the term, but it, it's called kit bashing. And so for Darth Vader and Princess Leia, those were like the, the first two that they kit bashed, at least according to a couple of sites that I looked at in the History Channel documentary. So Darth Vader, this guy right here, he was based off of the Fisher Price uh, firefighter. And Princess Leia was based off of the Fisher Price nurse. And they took an X-Acto knife and they would cut around the firefighter's hat so that they could develop the look of Darth Vader focus. So they carved around this firefighter's helmet, ended up developing Darth Vader. Vader, same thing with the Fisher Price nurse. That was pretty interesting. Then they would add putty to the figure, carve it up some more, and so forth. In May 25th, 1977, so the movie Star Wars was released, Kenner was not prepared for the mass orders in order for all of these figures to be available by Christmas. They needed to keep the five point articulation, the head turning, you got your arms and legs, right? Two, four, fifth point of articulation. Check out that Tuscan Raider. So what did Kenner do? Well, thanks to Bernie Loomis, they created early bird certificates, boxes. Bernie Loomis was like, we'll just sell them the box for Christmas. They called it an early bird certificate. You mail in a certificate that came with the box. And then whenever the figures were actually available by spring, essentially, you would get the first four that were available off their production line. So in spring 1978, all 12 figures that were advertised in their early bird special box were available. Although the first four were the only ones that you could get when you mailed in the certificate. And ultimately, Kenner sold 40 million action figures in 1978, about $100 million worth, which led to George Lucas's lawyer, Tom Pollock, to negotiate George Lucas's deal for The Empire Strikes Back. George Lucas made sure to negotiate all merchandising rights so Fox couldn't do any more in perpetuity licensing. So George Lucas, he reinvested his wealth into the Industrial Lights and Magic Company, his company ILM. He wrote and directed Star Wars, but when Empire Strikes Back came out, the creative control for the movie went to the director Irving Kirshner and the screenwriters Lawrence Kasdan and Lee Brackett. Harrison Ford, he was to die in the third movie. They decided to keep him alive in Return of the Jedi since a dead character doesn't sell toys. Yeah, that was the beginning of the end in Return of the Jedi. They were basing the movie off of too much data mining, too much focus groups, demographic information. It's like the beginning of the end, really, in my opinion. Because all that money that they were making, thanks to, you know, Empire Strikes Back, they saw that on the horizon after Star Wars. So when Ronald Reagan came into power. One of the first big acts that Reagan carried out was in 1981, the Telecommunications Competition and Deregulation Act as a result of Ronald Reagan appointing Mark Fowler as the head of the Federal Communications Commission. Telecommunications and Deregulations Act in 1981, that is what reversed uh, the regulations that were created as a consequence of Bernie Loomis's Hot Wheels television show. So it would open up the floodgates for all these television shows to promote merchandising, like, you know, G.I. Joe and, again, Strawberry Shortcake, Care Bears and fucking Transformers. We lost things like Electric Company, uh, Zoom, Animals, 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 Captain Kangaroo, you know, all these education-based shows, Schoolhouse Rock, they got put to the wayside because people like Ray Wagner were able to come onto the scene, learn from his mistakes, 
he was able to get out of the contract that he had with his licensing deal with Conan because they saw what an adult movie Conan was over at Mattel and Ray Wagner with his creative partner created He-Man. That He-Man television show, just looking at the He-Man figure next to a Luke Skywalker figure on top of the cartoon and these kids, they're gonna, they're gonna bite. So all that deregulation in the 80s, it also allowed for Mark Fowler the chair of the Federal Communications Commission, the Fairness Act was removed. It lasted from 1949 to 1987, which allowed for biased news. I mean, that, and then on top of, it was the Federal Communications Act that was passed in 1996, a year after the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade became the World Trade Organization in 1995. So no more journalism. Yeah, there's also some great images that I got from antiquetrader.com. This image here, of that early bird special, from that antique trader website. It's a great source. The early bird special. Which ones do I have? R2D2, right? Had it had that made these clicking noises. Sounds just like R2D2. And then you had Chewbacca with his bowcaster. And he's the only two that I have that were like original. I don't know if this particular model was from Star Wars or Empire Strikes Back, but um, these were your among the first two. <laughs> Luke Skywalker, he has blonde hair. He's got brown hair in his uh, white like robe. His, the first Luke Skywalker figure that was from Star Wars. He's got one with blonde hair, brown hair, and then the second blonde one has a del double telescoping extending lightsaber because you've got like the let me just do my dark Darth Vader because you would have the this deal here would also extend out you could be able to pull this out farther in addition to your main base so yeah there's a blonde version of the first Star Wars Luke Skywalker lightsaber that has an extending lightsaber. There's probably one with Darth Vader and Obi-Wan as well. So that was the double telescoping extending lightsaber. So you had eight more figures that came out after the movie on top of those four that came with the early bird special. All right, you had your four Star Wars action figures that came out. Here are two of them, right? Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker with um, Chewbacca and R2-D2. That's just the four. If you look on that early bird special, there's a total of 12. So then eight more came out. You had those 12 for 1978. And then after that, they capitalized on the anticipation of the Empire Strikes Back movie and created eight more action figures that you could buy waiting for the Empire Strikes Back movie to come out. So on the back of the Star Wars action figures, those cardboard backing boards, you know, in an, un in an unopened figure, the advertisements on back is either going to have 12 figures being listed for the initial run of Star Wars figures that were offered by Kenner. That's your 12 back. And then the next version that was being sold from Kenner are the 20 back set. It means that they've got 20 figures advertised on the back of those cardboard backing boards when the figures are being sold. Those cardboard backing boards also had a little square icon, a proof of purchase that you would cut out and send in to Kenner. If you sent four of them in at once, you would then get a mystery Star Wars promo figure that they would send out to you. And that was Boba Fett. Now, the original Boba Fett that they were gonna send out had a firing mechanism that you would pull back, right, right there. So see how that's like an L? Let's see that? It's more of a right angle right there. Well, that's the L design. That was, I think that was the first design. And then the second series just had like a little bit of a loop so that when you pulled back the firing mechanism with the spring, it would hold it a little bit more. It wouldn't misfire. And then, yeah, this missile would fire off of his back. And because of the um, danger of having one of these objects uh, kill a child, uh, they removed that option. That's why the firing mechanism with Boba Fett, I think it's just in the test version of these, the, the R&D, the beta version. I don't think there was ever a production model for a Boba Fett that had a firing mechanism, but if that's wrong, let me know in the comments. Coolest characters alive.
Admiral Akbar was the Return of the Jedi one, but with him, you had to send in six proofs of purchases by Return of the Jedi, but I think for Empire Strikes Back and for Star Wars, it was four. So the main 12 figures, you have Obi-Wan, Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, R2-D2, Chewbacca in that original set, Darth Vader, C-3PO, C-3PO, what's up? Han Solo. Storm Trooper. Death Squad Commander. Although I don't have a Jawa, the 12th figure from the original Star Wars line in 1977 is the Tusken Raider. The Sand Person. Bring the total of 12. Sales in 1979 again topped $100 million. In the original toys, which ran from 1977 to 1979, in total, 96 figures were made. 20 figures from the original line, 30 were added for The Empire Strikes Back, 1980 to 1982, and then 31 more figures were added for Return of the Jedi, 1983 to 1984, and 15 appeared as part of the Power of the Force line in 1985, a total of 96 Separate types of figure at that point. One particular item that's exclusive to a store. Also, Sears had an exclusive Cantina playset, and that had some exclusive figures that came with it initially, like Greedo, who I do not have here, unfortunately, but um, Hammerhead. Got it to focus finally. Hammerhead, what's up, dude? My God, look at this guy. All right, there we go. Got it to focus on Hammerhead. Walrus man. Get it to focus. There we go. Focus that on Walrus Man. There you go. And his web defeat. Snaggletooth. Originally in the Cantina set, there is a Snaggletooth. That is of just regular three and three quarters inch size. Lucas was like, no, no, no. This guy's supposed to be short. So the original snaggle tooth is the three and three quarters inch size with a blue suit. And then it was Lucas that corrected this. Told him he's supposed to be short with the red suit. So this is like second generation snaggle tooth. I didn't really collect much as far as the Return of the Jedi series, a little bit, but there were approximately 48 figures for Empire Strikes Back. And just go over some of these figures that I got right here. When the line ended in 1985, Kenner had sold approximately 250 to 300 million action figures. The company was bought by Tonka in 1987 and Hasbro in 1991. 
I think it was also in 1997, Hasbro bought Mattel. So then before they bought Mattel, they bought um, Tonka, which had bought Kenner. This, by the way, this guy, get a close up. This bounty hunter that appeared in Empire Strikes Back. Its name is, I think it's called Faram. Framb or Foramb. It's this bug head guy. The short one that also has like a bug head is called Succus. It's the smaller one that has a tan robe. So this is not Succus. This is, I think this dude's name is Faramb. I like that they did like a non-conventional look to this alien. Look like a bug head. IG-88 and Toilet Paper Man, Dengar. Gotta say, much props for the detail. Yeah, Kenner kicked ass on these figures. This is your Rebel Snow Trooper. Wow, check out the detail. Luke Skywalker there on the right. And that's just a regular Rebel Snow Soldier, Rebel Snow Soldier on the left here. Yeah, definitely cool detail. Bad too with the likenesses, I gotta say, on most of these. What do you think? Does that look like Harrison Ford? So, of the first 12. Can I match? All right, so of the first 12 figures on that 12 back card, the original first version of Star Wars action figures on the back of their backing board, the first version has 12 figures being displayed. Of those 12, the original 12 Star Wars action figures released in 1978, I have all of them except for Princess Leia, the original Luke Skywalker, and the other two, Obi-Wan and Jawa. And this is the order that they were being displayed. It's not even a photograph on the original 12 back. It's like a painting of them so I'm missing four of the original 12 on that first version card back the 12 back the 20 back and let me display these in the order that they're shown in the back of the 20 back version All right, so now you're looking at the array of the next set of figures that were available at Kenner in 1978. At first, you had the painting of 12 action figures on the first version of the Kenner Star Wars toys, the 12 back. Now, the next 
set of Star Wars toys and the next run of Kenner toys that were being sold. On the back of their backing board, you'll see 20 separate photographs of Star Wars action figures. That is the 20 back series. Those 20 figures, these are the ones that I have. You had your original 12, and of the eight new figures, I'm missing Guido, the Power Droid, and R5-D4. I think this guy's name is a Signore Calimari. Hey, hey, you like the calamari fried? I get you fried calamari. I mean, when you got a uh, mixed media here, plastic and cloth. Uh, if anybody knows of any of these here are going to be like hundreds of dollars, let me know. I don't know much about Star Wars figures, how much they're worth. This close up of calamari. Yeah, I don't know what this guy's name was. What have I got here? Lando Calrissian. Billy D. Williams likeness right here. Lobot. That was the name of his assistant. Strikes back. Let's see, what do I have of the bounty hunters? In a way, you guess you could say this is like a bounty hunter. Return of the Jedi, Princess Leia. It's a nice fit with this helmet. I don't know, do they make action figures this decent today? I mean, today it's more like you're buying something for adults, so it's not going to be opened. It's going to be kept in its case, or it's going to be more of a statue that will just sit up on a stand on someone's desk, windowsill, whatever. But more like statues, statuettes than they are. Action figures, but for something like this that is designed for kids to play with, Attention to detail is spectacular. Uh, I think these were better than the G.I. Joe ones. Wasn't too up on those, though. There's, an, there's your bounty hunter. IG-88. It's a bughead dude. Faram, I think. I don't remember that dude's name. It's Dengar. Bosk. Yeah, not bad detail at all. Let's check out his hands. Check out that slee stack. And then the ultimate, the ultimate bounty hunter, the Fet. Used and abused. Take a bow. This was not a mail away Boba Fett. I know that. Two different versions of the firing jetpack. I mean, because of, was it Ray Wagner over at, at uh, Mattel? They had a bunch of action figures around the television show, Battlestar Galactica. The show was awful. I couldn't get into it myself, but also because 
with Battlestar Galactica, I think their Cylon vehicle, it fired these like red plastic pieces of plastic and a kid had choked on it and it was the Cylon spaceship. But in the coroner's report, they said Star Wars toy. So that put the kibosh on toys with little firing mechanisms. Cool. Boba Fett, the ultimate bounty hunter. I don't know what happened. Oh, Suckus. It's too bad. I lost Suckus. That sucks. I lost that little guy. His little bug friend. That sucks. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Did you think that was funny? Suckus is gone. Snow Troopers, pretty fucking cool. Definitely had lots of use. This dude's super cool. TIE Fighter Pilot. Yeah, that symbol on his uniform, by the way, was influenced by the Okura Kurosawa movie, Hidden Fortress. Detail there on the gown. So five things that Barry Loomis left us. The new weekend tradition, he created the first cartoon to be based off of a toy property. It's brought us our Saturday morning weekly tradition in the United States. And then by the time Reagan was in power, Reagan appointed Mark Fowler head of the FCC, which then caused that particular regulation to be removed. But they didn't remove the early bird special. That's another invention from Bernie Loomis. Right? Sell them the box if you don't have the toys available. And that's another thing that Bernie Loomis created that got outlawed. No more early bird certificates were allowed after the Christmas of 1977. Bernie Loomis also brought us the term toyetic. That's right. Let's not forget how well his people kitbashed that term kitbashing. And you take a toy and you carve it up to invent something new. What's left? Ammunition. These were part of a toy uh, that came with the, the vehicle that I had displayed in my vid around New Year's Day. It's the Stormtroopers transport vehicle. That vehicle was made up by the Kenner Company. It wasn't in the Star Wars movie. And you would put these, this came with the vehicle. It's like a truck that had like three compartments on each side of it. You could put people in and they were the Stormtroopers prisoners and you put this over them so that it would subdue their prisoners. Yeah. I think this is IG-88's. Oh, nice. This one, I know who this belongs to.
All right. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, yeah, this is the uh, Stormtrooper. Right, yeah. I think this is a Bespin gun. I don't know. Yeah, Han Solo's gun right there. More of these Stormtrooper guns. Another Han Solo type looking pistol. Ah, that's it. So no bowcaster. Shit. That's all for the armory, and that's all for the show. So when the line ended by 1985, Kenner had sold approximately 250 million to 300 million action figures. That's right, that term that was coined by the Hassenfeld brothers. The main driving force behind the Hasbro brothers success was the brother Merrill L. Hassenfeld. Went from him coining the term action figure with G.I. Joe. Those 11 and a half inch tall plastic soldier dolls to today's action figures. Three and three quarter height. Brought to you by Bernard Loomis and his team over at Kenner. We got tradition started, laws made, then removed again. Degradation of journalism and education. Wow. We all become aware of every little intricate detail of nothingness. Pieces of plastic. Thank you very much for checking out my action figure history video i be that sequential geek thanks for visiting my channel sequential geek I really had a fun time checking out all this history behind toys in america and the minds behind it burning loomis I had no idea this was going to turn into some type of like toy history burning loomis vid but that's how i do thanks a lot for swinging by appreciate your time hope you were able to take away something from this thanks a lot for checking out my wares Appreciate your time. Till next time. Peace.